Adrian Sanning, everybody. Thank you. So like, how awesome is this? Hack Fort 2, bigger than Hack Fort 1. I kind of miss the shrine. You know, like the, that symbol of thing. But, uh, but it's really great. And, and this is, uh, oh, the lighting is going down. Because I was going to say, like, this lighting is, it's like being at Worldwide Developers Conference or something. You can't see, I couldn't see anybody. So my dad used to say, don't, uh, don't take wooden nickels. Uh, but I guess in this case, this is like sort of a secret to, to, uh, to get a drink after we're down here, right? And so um, to encourage tweeting, uh, I'm giving away these two drink tokens to the two best tweets during the, the, uh, the session. So the tweet uh, handle is pound hack fork two. And like the first tweet will have a claim on one of these unless somebody makes a better one. So, you know, you really should get something in. So we're going to try to talk about, uh, about what it is to hack the civic space. And, uh, you know, that's kind of an unusual thing to think about. I'm not sure anybody would even have, five or six years ago, would even have understood what that could mean. But these days, the civic space is being hacked all day, all over town. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want to talk about a particular kind of hack that happens. But, like, what do I even mean by hack in the civic space? Well, think about this clown, Henry Ford, right? He just wants to make some money, and he does a mashup of assembly line and, you know, wagon technology and, and in the internal combustion engine, and, and he does make money. But he also completely transformed American society, right? He unleashed this whole thing that, you know, I'm not sure, but if it was put to a vote in 1920, hey, how about if we just transform America, put put roads everywhere, people will spend hours getting to work and hours getting home, we'll like burn up all the oil. I mean, I'm not sure people would have gone, yeah, yeah, okay, sure, sign me up, put me down for a Model T. I'm not sure that that would have happened had people known what the total consequence of the hack would be. And I'm not even sure it's relevant, right? Like when you think about, there's, there's, there's Alan Turing in front of that, one of those early computing devices that they made. They're not thinking, oh yeah, that will mean that three days ago, the Chicago Board of the, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange will just be closed. Closed? You mean temporarily? Was there like a terrorist attack? No, no, no. Just shut. We don't need it anymore. What are you talking about? How do we decide commodities prices? Oh, well, computers do that now. Like, think about that just for a minute, right? Because one by one by one by one by one, all the things people used to do, computers do now. And this trading thing. Here, you. Come on. Right here. Right? What do you give me for pork bellies? What do you think the price should be? Yell it out. See, he doesn't even know. <laughs> right? These guys, they'd be in that thing. They'd be yelling back and forth. Dynamically, one of the hardest things you could imagine doing. Don't need it. And, like, if those guys had had a vote, maybe they'd say, wait, whoa, hold on, time out. Can we change the way we're doing this hack? But it doesn't really work like that. I think, you know, we've got this idea that it's done like this. That we have laws, rules. That's how we hack the civic space. We like to vote on it. We introduce legislation and we discuss it. And then we pretty much never agree on anything and don't, don't do anything. That's what we think of as the way that our civic space is hacked. But in fact, I submit to you that this is really the way your civic space is hacked. By what you buy. Think about all the resource allocation decisions that are made here in Boise. How many of them are made by the council? And how many of them are made by what people sell and what people buy? That's what determines everything. Like, that is what determines what happens. That mercantile exchange, why did it get shut down? Was it legislated down? Or like, it just doesn't work anymore because the other people get all the business. And so do I. It's not just what you buy and sell either, right? Economic activity is where tremendous amounts of innovation happen. Right? Like that is, in a sense, what the economic system does for us, is make it possible for us to figure out what innovations we should do and at what scale and how much should they be funded and how should we change our society. We do it with this hacking culture. And, and it's not bad, it's awesome. Do you know how many people are on the planet? Like, 50 years ago, 
The number of people on the planet, unthinkable. Why can we sustain people at this level? How can we even manage it? Because of enormous technological innovations that we've been doing for the past thousand years, based on this idea that, well, however we do it now, there's a way to do it better. Not just a little better, but a lot better. And devil take the hindmost in terms of what happens when those changes come. That's just how we roll. There's a kind of notion that it's like inevitable, right? That if somebody can think of a better, cheaper, faster way to do something, then it'll be done. They might be successful at it. A different company might be successful at it. There'll be a competition around it. But sooner or later, if it can be done, it will be done. And that doesn't sort of go with the way that we normally think of the way we organize our civic square, because we normally think that it would be done in some sort of disciplined way based on how we vote, based on how we decide. Now this is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem precisely because of the time constant involved in how long it takes for a technology to emerge and then get adopted. This graph, it's a pretty famous graph, lots of people have seen it. It sort of goes like this. Uh, here's, the, here's, here's Henry Ford. It's like 19.5, whatever. How long did it take to get to almost 100% of households having a car. Wow, maybe like by 1975. And that's a long time, that's 75 years. How long did it take cell phones to go from invention to like near global ubiquity? Much, much shorter period of time, right? So this diffusion curve is accelerating and that means that the hacking of the civic square, the time between the emergence of the idea and the transformation of the civic square because of the idea, used to happen over decades, so a society could kind of adjust to it. Now it's much more difficult, because these ideas come out of the blue, and then they're there. We'll talk about some, some of those ideas in a second. But as I said, right, there's this sort of furious race now. If that's the human race there, this is an a, a illustration taken out of Ray Kurzweil's spiritual machine, right? And there's, there's, there's the human race writing on this thing. What is it that people can still do that computers can't? And on the floor there are all the things, oh, well, I used to be able to be the best at chess. Not anymore. Checkers, no. Trading on the mercantile exchange, no. So many things ended up on the floor. And this is just those things which technology does by itself. Because that's a tendency we have to sort of think about technology as, uh, oh, yeah, it's this, it's this thing that we do, and then it replaces a former activity. It's a machine that we put in place of the humans that used to do the thing. But increasingly, there's a new kind of thing. There's a, and, and we'll talk about that new kind of thing in a second. Um, yeah, enough, you know, like I could tell you all these tales of woe, right? Oh, how sad it is that these technological innovations displace entire communities in their whole way of life, and they just sort of sink back into it. Now, this isn't a new debate, right? The people on the side of, hey, wait a minute, let's think this through. I'm not sure this is the inevitable. Maybe we should delay some of these technological advances. We have a name for those people, we call those people Luddites. And we call those people Luddites because of the first Luddite, this guy Ned Ludd, or King, King Ludd, they call him. And he sort of led revolts against the incorporation of technology into weaving, right? Because weaving is one of the first places where computers really kind of took hold. You could take this card and you could map out very complicated patterns, and then this device could make things that previously only people could ever make. Because these patterns were very complicated, but the machine could do it. And, and there was very controversial. And you know, Queen Elizabeth, when uh, the, the stocking frame knitting machine in 1589, they came to Queen Elizabeth and said, hey, check out my new hack. This is an awesome thing. What do you think? She says, uh, hey, that's awesome, Master Lee. I'm translating from Old English. That's, that's awesome, Master Lee. But uh, dude, think about what it's going to do to the people, right? Like, this machine is going to make you a ton of money, but it's going to destroy the livelihoods of all my people, and therefore, not so much, was Queen Elizabeth's ruling, right? Did Queen Elizabeth stop it? No. Temporary delay, temporary change. But the inevitability of these changes is, is, is really tough, right? It's just really, really tough. If someone can figure it out, think about some of these things, if you will. Somebody earn a coin by telling me some other things that we've eradicated, we've hacked, to create, like, here, I'll give you one to get you started. What about piracy? Right? You guys, you guys remember? I, I remember I was in between jobs. 
I just quit my job and I was just getting ready to start another job and Napster came out. And there I was in my bathrobe in the glow of those screens downloading music like a mother chicken. Because <laughs> uh, because you could. And you just could. And yeah, I knew it was wrong in the way that I knew driving 57 miles an hour was wrong when the speed limit was 55, but I'm sorry. If it can be done, it will be done. So, you know, this is really getting to another level with what I'm going to call these mechanical Turk applications. And this is really what I want to talk about for the rest of the time, is these mechanical Turk hacks. So, like, the best one that I know of is this magic one. So how many people have read about magic? Awesome. Okay, for the rest of you. There's these guys, and, and by the way, I'm telling the story my way. It might not even be true. There's these guys, it's like maybe three or four months ago, right? You can look it up. You can find your own version of the story if you want. There are these people, and they're engaged in a startup. And it's kind of going okay, but not great. And one of them, on the weekend, goes, you know what we should do? The startup we got is done. Now, every one of you who's been involved in a hack or a startup knows this happens someplace in the, it's starting to get hard. It's starting to get, yeah, the one we're doing now is done. Let's start a different one. And so they came up with an idea on the weekend. They said, you know what we should do is, you should just be able to text us a query for anything. And we'll just get it. And then we'll pay, and then we'll take a little piece out of the transaction. So somebody texts you, I need a tiger by 11.30. We'll figure out how to get the tiger, deliver it, and take a little piece off the top. Because what can't you get on the internet? And so, you know, a lot of our requests were just fulfilled through Amazon for people who are too stupid to do the shopping. And so they come up with this idea and they put up a web page which essentially is their app. And then they just wait to see if anybody comes. And like 10,000 people came in the first weekend. And so what they did was just start getting all their friends and people to come and sit on the other end of this app and figure out how to get whatever it is people came in to say they wanted. And that's a classic Mechanical Turk app. Now, the Mechanical Turk gets its name. How many people are familiar with this term, Mechanical Turk? We're just going to do a little survey. A little better than the number of people familiar with magic, but still not so many. So Edgar Allan Poe has a great story called Mazel's Chess Player that actually describes a real thing that really happened in the 1800s. There was this, I think it's like in the sort of circa 1850, and there's this touring device. Now, that's not an actual one. That's a reconstruction. But you see there's a sort of automaton up there, a Turk. And then inside, you see all these gears, and all this different stuff, and you look in there, and you like, that's how the mechanical trick works. And they close it up, and then they find the best chess player in the room to play this guy in chess, and they get their clock cleaned by a thing that's made out of clockwork in 1850. I don't think so. And so the way that really worked, of course, is that's in one of those magician's boxes, and there's this dwarf inside who's really good at chess. And so that's who you're really playing. <laughs> Right? Like, you're there. There's all this machinery. There's the great trick. Oh, I'm ready to play you. And he moves pawn to king four, and then you move. And then, like, underneath the little dwarf inside the box is looking up through the glass, seeing what move you make, and then, like, working the little levers to make the Turk do the move. But the effect to you was as though there was a device doing it. Now, Amazon's got a name for the mechanical Turk, too. What it is is a big dispatch to take tasks that you break up and get people to do them for microtransactions. And so what you can do now, right, is essentially have a programmatic interface to a group full of people. So imagine you guys were all signed up with Mechanical Turk, right? And I'm the guy doing magic. And so I get the SMS queries in, my app parses them out, and then it figures out how to turn them into something called a hit which is a job for a person to do, and then it puts it up on the board, and everybody who's certified to be able to do that job bids to take it down, and then you do it, and the results come back, and the results are programmatically then part of my app. And so what it is, it's like an API to people. It's like a sweatshop API. <laughs> and so now when you think about like, hey, how do I solve a really hard problem, a problem where there are certain aspects of it that would just be too hard to get code to do. Yes, get your own little sweatshop to do it. And then overall, you can build an app with a lot of value. Now, I'm making light of this because I'm trying to point out some of the, I don't know, some of the risks inherent in introducing a hack like this on a system where we do work a different way right now. 
but it is awesome. Like in terms of actually in the technology trying to figure out how it is that you're going to solve certain problems that otherwise are. Think about like when Google decided they were going to map every place in the country. Like the first time that you hear that they're doing that, you're like, well, I'm going to short Google because that's not going to happen. The country's really big and they're only one country. But of course what they do is figure out, oh, well, we'll build this car with the thing on the top that like looks at everywhere that it goes and GPS track and yik and yak. It does everything except drive itself. Now, of course, they made drive itself versions, right? But they can't deploy all those. So what they do is there's a piece of it that a person knows. Here, you, just drive around Boise. Let me know when you're done. And then they just do that thousands of times over, and bang, you've got a system to map the entire country that uses human intelligence, but in this really narrow way. And not in a way where the human is in charge, but in the way where a human is a cog in a very big operation. Now you might think like, oh, this is, uh, this is not real. People aren't really doing this. Now I can see why Boise might think that. Because, um, <laughs> So I was in the airport today, thinking I might uh, take my favorite taxi service, and I find out, isn't this awesome? Uber basically has a campaign against your mayor and your city council to every one of us who comes in from out of town and expects an Uber car to pick them up. And they go, oh, don't blame us, blame the mayor of Boise. <laughs> now, Uber, how many of you know what Uber is? Just get again, all right, good. Here, we're going to talk about Uber to analyze it as one of these Mechanical Turk apps. Oh, sorry. Oh, hey, and I didn't do this on purpose. I'm telling you, I just... All right. Oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Come on, anything for the, anything for the council. There we go. <laughs> and, like, look at this. Even down here, tell City of Boise and why Boise needs Uber. They're all over there. How do you fight things? Resistance is futile. Anyway, <laughs> what do they actually do, right? Like, we have a perfectly good system here in Boise for getting people to and from the airport. It's worked for a really long time. <whistles> How hard is that? Like, that's a thing that needs to be disrupted? And also, like, You know, like now you can see easy how you disrupt it because Uber figured it out. But before that, it didn't seem, wow, here's this network. It isn't even a network, right? Because regionally, it's all different. Every place has their own stuff. There's these people from Iden Rides as taxi services, and there's these people doing it as limousines, and there's gypsy cabs, and there's this and that. How would you, like, you can see why they call it Uber. Oh, yeah, yeah. However, all that was done. <laughs> Stupid. All there is is an app. Now, if you haven't used this app, you should, because you'd never want to take another way of getting a car in your life ever. Because it's awesome. It's like being Batman. You like get off the plane and go, I'm here. And the thing goes, well, it's going to cost you 11 bucks to get to where you want to go, or 20 bucks, or 30 bucks, whatever it's going to cost. And then you go, well, uh, can, what, I'd like to yeah, get, bring him. Uh, five minutes, here's the guy. And you watch him like the Joker coming over to you. Then you get in the car, you drive away, he knows where to go, you watch him while he's doing it because you both have the same map and you're sharing it till you get to the place you get. And then what do you do? You get out of the car and you leave, that's it. Well, how does he get paid? I don't know, that's mechanical turf business. <laughs> so somebody, like think about it, as an app, it's really impressive in one way, like wow, the Batman part where you know where the cars are, but you know how that trick is done. That's Google Maps, whatever. Nate Will can whip you that up in no time. He's available right there in the third row. <laughs> he, can, he can bolt Google, Google Maps into your API all day long, and then all that stuff that got done just is part of your app, so that's nothing. Well, like, how hard is it to go, I want to ride? Well, the user interface for that is not so tough, and the database for it isn't that tough either, and the dispatching of that to people who are looking to give you a ride, that's not very hard. And figuring out how far away you are and keeping that's trivial. That app, literally, if we did it as a hack, we would have gotten pretty close in a weekend. Because the number of things you do in this app, very narrow. And then you release this app together with the stones to fight any organization that dares oppose you, including the city council of Boise. And when you do that, 
you suddenly have a valuation that's greater than Hertz. Now think about that for a minute. Hertz. How old is Hertz? Hertz. What do they own? Every airport, thousands of cars, hundreds of thousands of employees. These guys have like three servers in that app, and they're worth $40 billion. Why? Because they built this mechanical turf network. And that mechanical turf network generated itself. You make a mechanism by which people can join it, both as riders and as drivers, and the rest of it is trivial. Now, I don't mean to like it like way trivial, right? But I see the hackers in the room going, yeah, damn it, why didn't I think of it? <laughs> now, the thing is, right, that's as complicated as that transaction really is. There's a driver over here. There's a passenger over there. We're even accommodating the idea of word of mouth for future passengers. And that's all the arrows there are in that app. And it disrupts an entire industry that's 100 years old. Why? Oh, because it's not just a technology app. It's an app that imagines building an army of people who are coordinated to provide a massive service at national scale. That's the sort of protocol. That's as complicated as it was. And like, look at each one. Riders hail cars on the side of the road if you can find one, if the driver has peripheral vision, if the driver decides to stop. <laughs> on the other hand, one click on your smartphone, here comes the car, you get status about when it'll arrive, you even get a picture of the driver and can have a little conversation with him before he gets here. Now, which way is better? It's not even hard. And the number of transactions is so small that it's possible to do it really, really. Now, what I'm submitting to you is you, you're looking for a hack. Mechanical Turk stuff is where the, where the action is. The only problem is when you make a hack like this and raise up an army like this, you're going to win, but somebody's going to lose. Like when you build Uber, if I have a taxi medallion in New York City, it used to be worth millions of dollars, and all of a sudden the market in taxi medallions has plummeted. You can't, you can't get one to buy it. You can't get somebody to buy one, almost at any price. Because you know that million dollars is now in Uber's pocket instead of your pocket. But we didn't vote on that. Who's like, whoa, that's like a massive resource realignment. How did this, thank God, that city of Boise is putting a stop to this Uber thing before it gets out of control. But like, obviously. There's no resistance. It's futile. What? You're going to be the only place you can't hail an Uber cab? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Like, and I don't have anything against it. It's just, like, like, like how do you think it's going to work out? And I think Germany's in the same place. You know, like, Boise and Germany are trying to stand fast against it. But this is really tough. <laughs> All right, so, so this brings me to, like, to, to, to connect this talk to my previous talk. Right? So last year I came to you and talked to you about a hack that I want to do. Now, it's not fair to call it a hack because it's not a weekend thing. But it is, in another way, a hack. Because it's a giant mashup to try to build one of these, one of these, uh, one of these uh, mechanical turf kind of apps. So uh, let me just give a little background for those of you who weren't here last time. Um, the idea is to build the Young Ladies Illustrated Primer. The Young Ladies Illustrated Primer is this thing that comes out of Neil Stevenson's Diamond Age. And it's an educational technology that he described in like the, I want to say this book came out in like, can somebody find out when it came out and tweet it for me? That might be worth a coin. When did Diamond Age come out? Like you, you didn't used to be able to do this kind of stuff, but now everybody knows everything. All right, so um, it's like in the 90s, maybe it's 2000s. And it's a device that you have, it looks remarkably like an iPad, though they didn't know that then. And, and what it does is provide you with a learning experience that's immersive. It lasts a really, really long time. This device bonds with you, and it watches your habits, and it watches your behavior. 1995. Thank you very much, 1995. Ethereum. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> putting, putting out of business all the research librarians in the country. So, so um, uh, 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 I'm sorry, we were talking about something. What was it? Oh, yeah. Um, so this primer, right? Oh, no, no, you don't get it until the end. Because like, you know who's going to decide? This is my man. Uh, 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 your name is Jack. No, no. Hold on. We're going to come over and meet him. Just tell you what my name was. Jack. Jack, Jack, last name. Shoot. 
Yeah, so Jeff Chu is the one who's gonna decide who gets the coins. That's how it's gonna go. All right, so, um, yeah, so we're coming, yeah, exactly. So you might wanna tweet about Jeff, how tall he is. He's so handsome. How could you forget his name? Well, you know, the stress of the lights, that's what I'm gonna blame it on. Okay, so, so the primer, right? This device, it bonds to you, it provides you with this education, it tracks what you do, it personalizes your education as a result. It does one other thing that's real mechanical turkey. It knows when it can't help you anymore. And when it can't help you anymore, it summons a human to step into the context that it's already in and has that human help. These people are called raptors, it's really cool. Now obviously, build and map thing, that's a moonshot thing. That'd be really hard to build. Because you know, like you'd need the Unreal Engine and you'd need to make all these really cool immersive environments and you know, like it, we, not getting there from here. But we could begin with the core of the idea. So if you take the primer and you roll it down the hill, what you're trying to do is redesign that. Right, like, and particularly in math, you're gonna try to redesign that. Instead of trying to do math that way, like, okay, today, class, we're all gonna learn about synthetic division. How many of you already know synthetic division? Hands up, not so many. Oh, yeah? Here, please explain. Oh, really? <laughs> That's what I thought. No one knows synthetic division. Okay, so, so, thanks for being a good sport. Okay, so, so here's the thing, right? Everybody in this room has math deficits they don't know about. Because every one of you went through the same thing. They taught you math, you went as fast as you could, you got good grades on some tests, you got weaker grades on other tests, and every one of the weaker grades represents an opportunity for a cavity in your math knowledge. And then next year and year after that, those cavities, they just grow and they rot out your mathematical teeth. <laughs> what you should do, right, right now, is go up and register with the Khan Academy and work on the world of math, fix all your teeth. You could go up there and it would, it would poll you on all the stuff that you know and don't know, and it would help you identify where your math cavities are, and then you could just really spend all your time and energy working on that, fixing your mathematical teeth. Don't see a lot of people doing that. <laughs> At ASU, you know, we've been working on this for a while. And what we think is important is some people could do it that way, and they are doing it that way. Khan's got like 11 million users a month going up there and filling in their mathematical cavities. They've served up three billion math problems in a year and a half, and that's like McDonald's burger territory. We're talking serious numbers, right? And so some people are doing it. But most people need the support of a group of people to help. And the software, it runs out, right? Like there's a place at which it doesn't know what to do. And so what you need then is a human. A human will stand behind the other thing, step in and, and try to help that. And so past year at ASU, we've been working on that. Now you see the mechanical Turk connection right away, right? There are people who have questions about mathematics. And there are other people, lots of people, who know the answer. It used to be there weren't lots of people. There was like your math teacher. In my town, his name was Mr. Vernerak. He was a German immigrant. He just really had it in for my sister. <laughs> no, I mean, he did. Like my sister, she just, she wasn't very good at algebra. And, and he just had it in for her. He was just, he was the only place to get the explanations and he wasn't giving them to her. And so when I started algebra seven years later, he's like, you are Sandy Manier's uh, brother? It is impossible. <laughs> and he would give the explanations to me. But he was the only guy in our town who knew anything about algebra. But these days, the opportunity to pair up the people who know about a thing with people who have questions about a thing, oh man, can we do that till the cows come home? Right? Till the cows come home. And so this combination of internet scale math application with, yeah, it really plays up here in Iowa. I don't know. Hey, but the president gave a shout out to this, right? So that's pretty cool. Anyway, um, you know, the combination of this app, this sort of, this app that is the, the Uber of, uh, of math, right? Has most of the answers, has ways to explain it, has hints, problems, ways you can try it, tests, a lot of the things that a teacher used to do. And then there comes this moment where you just don't know what to do, and if we could get a human to answer your question in math, well then, uh, what do we need math teachers for? <coughs> like, why do we need taxi drivers? We'll just use it a different way. We'll, like, deprofessionalize this. We'll get all kinds of people all around the world know the answers to very complicated problems. You can provide them in videos, not unlike Sal Khan's videos, that people find very useful for learning. Wow. 
That's really how people are going to learn math. Yeah, like you can imagine a little coaching app like this. A little, a little coaching app. Oh. Anyone that thing? All right, uh, a little coaching app like this. That would be like when you had a question, it would connect you with your coach, and you could talk to them about the problem and ask them. And you know what we found? We've done some tests. People do really well when they learn this way, especially when you compare it to, okay, class, now we're all going to learn synthetic division. Whether or not any of you have the prerequisites to understand how to do it, today's the day when we're doing it. I'm explaining it. Did you get it or not? We give you the test, and then some of you get an A or B, and then after that, everybody else will never understand synthetic division ever again. Very different than that. So what I'm suggesting is take that and scale it up to, like, Google scale. I just want you to imagine, what if we had the Uber of math education? Like we literally had a device. You could go up and ask it. it. It could sort of help you build a study plan for what it is you wanted to learn. And then you could go up and ask it anything. And sometimes you'd be getting answers from a machine. And other times you'd be getting answers from a person. You wouldn't even really be able to tell the difference. But the important thing is you're getting the answer. And in this way, you just keep advancing. Now let's suppose a thing like that existed. On the one hand, that sounds like a really awesome thing. Like, if I told you, hey, what if we, have, I just invented a microwave that you just showed a picture of what you want, push a button, and it comes out. Wow, awesome. Who doesn't want that? Everybody who makes anything anywhere. <laughs> right, like, so, you know, like this idea that Uber's great. Yeah, Uber is great. For me, the buyer, but if this thing comes out, what does it do to teachers? So that's the question that I want to leave you with, is what does it do to teachers? Now, I have some ideas, and I'd like to get them out in conversation. But I'd also like to hear from you guys about this notion. If we start to restructure ourselves around these mechanical Turk inventions, what does it do to the way we interact? And does it erode some of the, some of the institutions that we really need? So, like, we're going to talk about this until you're bored. <laughs> or until we all want to go drink. <laughs> so let me have some idea that there's at least one person out there that has a question. Otherwise, I'm going to, yeah, all right, so good. So we're going to get a microphone back to you while my, uh, while my pal, Jeff Shook, come up, come up, comes on up here and we have, like, one of these actor studio conversations. So here we are in the actor studio. Do we have a... I have this mic. Send it around like that. Hang on, I'll do it. Here we go. You need a turk. Come down this way. <laughs> so the question I have is, you say, what happens when we start to crumble these um, systems that we have in place that we need? Do we really need them? If we can replace them with some kind of technology, do we really need them? I mean, did we really need cab service that isn't Uber? Well, so I'll tell you what I think, and I hope there's other, other reactions in the audience, right? Robert Reich wrote a book in the late 90s. Maybe somebody could look it up for me. Uh, it's called The Future of Success. And I hear that Siri's really good at looking that kind of stuff up. Anyway, he writes his book, The Future of Success, right? And, and whether or not you like Reich's positions on economic policy, one thing you'll have to admit, he nailed it in this book by saying that what technology's going to do is make things great for consumers and awful for service providers. And so what does he mean by that? Well, let's take Uber as the example. I'm going to tell you, having used Uber now in like 15 different cities, Uber rocks. It's really great. The drivers tend to be terrific. Once you've built up a reputation in the system, they all, if you are a five rider, they always send you a five driver. They get there on time. They're fast. It's amazing. The cab, you know, like all the stuff is clean. It's terrific. So as a consumer, awesome. But I always talk to my Uber driver. Hey, how do you like it? I love it, say they. I didn't used to drive, and now I do, and I can supplement my income, and I can work whenever I want, and I think it's really great. The only people I hear complain are, oh, I hate this. Why? Well, I used to be a cab driver. And when I was a cab driver, I had protections. I had all these, I, I, I had a certain safety in the way that I was doing it. I had to have insurances, and I had to have registration, and I had to be checked out. And the Uber drivers, they don't have to do any of that stuff. And so it made it much more competitive for that person. Now, what I'll say is, as a, as a user, it's great. And as a provider, if you're like a really good hustler, right, then it too is great. 
But it does disrupt the position that the other guy held. You might say, well, hell, devil take the hindmost. Yeah, but till you're hindmost. And then you'll be looking for protection. And on that day, you won't get it. Now, I'm not up here selling the idea that it needs to be restricted, because I don't believe it can be. But what I'm saying is, as a society, we're going to have to deal with the idea that we can just disrupt entire professions in less than five years. And that it, it isn't confined to just people who drive cabs. So, uh, Hold on, we've got to get a mic to you. Wait just a second, the Mechanical Turk is on its way. <laughs> He's processing the hit. And he hands it off to the right person. Rating five. He gets a, be like next time, more likely to get the next mic. <laughs> yes, Bill. So my thought on this is that any position that could be replaced by a machine would be. So context and experience and, and analysis are the things that will actually exist beyond this. Um, talking to a guy just a little, uh, few days ago where he was, a, uh, he was doing some type of uh, mechanical job and then decided to take up truck driving. And my first thought was, oh, shoot, you know, here we're going to have autonomous vehicles. And, and the trucks are going to go first because they're expensive and yeah. risky, right? So it's a matter of, uh, um, as I have kids and I'm raising them up, making sure that they are looking at professions where they, that requires analysis that can't be replaced by machines, which will never, that will never solve. Okay, so I, I'm not going to, you know, because it, to make a worse race, I'm just completely disagree with you. So I, on the one hand, I do agree with you. Like I tell my own kids, hey, you want to try to pick something that it's hard for computers to disrupt. You picked analysis, I'll throw back Watson. I don't know if you've seen how fast Watson is moving since it won the Jeopardy challenge against the smartest Jeopardy player in the earth, Ken Jennings, right? It mopped the floor with Ken. And now it's turned its, uh, its you know, world domination brain to two subjects, legal analysis and medical analysis. And what they're doing is pumping it full of every case in case law. And then they're, on the other hand, they're pumping it full of you know, every diagnostic piece of information. Like, back in the days, in the 80s, when I was studying artificial intelligence, we talked about the idea of trying to make expert systems by being able to mine the expertise. But what they found is those were too brittle. Well, in this generation, all you do is stuff the facts in, and then Watson sorts them out. They say that Watson's going to have an enormous impact on the value of legal research. And what that can do is hollow out the entirety of a law firm, especially if you combine Watson with sort of low paid labor that could do the tricky bits, right? In a mechanical turkey kind of way. I'm kind of, I'm trademarking mechanical turkey right here. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, I'm not sure anything is safe the minute that the technology becomes able to do it. And, and the other thing that I think is dangerous, like think about the, the thing about schools, right? If you, if you make it possible for people to make an argument that, oh yeah, this thing works at least as good as it used to work when we had people teaching math, so we don't need math teachers anymore. If people take that political position, they could hollow out your school. Now another person in Denmark might take a completely different point of view, right? Person in Denmark might think, oh yeah, this is great. This will let our teachers do other things. This will let our teachers allow our students to be even better prepared for life. It will let them do human things that really are beyond the can of a machine. Like, hey son, it seems like the last three weeks in a row you haven't really been making any progress in math. Is something going on at home that I need to know about? Is there something wrong with the, you know, like, are you losing motivation? Are you under threat? Those are things that if we had these devices and constructed our school system the right way, we could do better than we've ever done. But the risk is that the order of operations happens where, no, 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 you end up closing the board of trade before you realized you actually needed it for some other purpose. So these are, I think, things that a place that's moving this fast and has this much capability has to be pretty cautious about. So I want to complicate the discussion a little bit. Uh, you've been focusing largely on uh, mechanical Turks that deal with things we do. Right, But you mentioned a few minutes ago the way we interact. So I want to ask you about uh, technology that changes the things that we say and how we can say them. Oh, and by that I mean Twitter, Absolutely. Snapchat, Yik Yak. Uh, there are campuses that are cracking down on Yik Yak because people are sitting in class and making comments about how fat their teachers are. 
where should the limits be? You know, this is civic hacking in a lot of ways. It's completely yeah. transforming this, the public space. That's a fantastic thing. And I, I think it'd be great to like begin a dialogue on this. I'll give you my impressions. It's absolutely true that the advent of the internet has raised incivility to, a, to an epidemic, and, and particularly targeted kinds of incivility. The incivility towards women on the internet is, you know, speaking as a person now who is gray of beard, I don't ever in my lifetime ever remember anyone talking to a woman like that. And now it is considered something you just have to endure, don't feed the trolls. How can this be? And when we talk to the leaders of these firms, when we talk to the leader of Twitter, or we talk to the leaders of Yik Yak, they completely disavow what their technology is used for. Well, hey, I can't help it, what people do with it. You know, I just invented the atomic. If people go and blow stuff up, what am I supposed to do about it? And so it is really complicated. Because on the one hand, when these outrages happen, a democratic society can get its hackles up and try to move to do something draconian to stop it. And I don't think any of those things will actually work, right? So this is a really complicated thing for our society. And in a lot of ways, we got to grow up. You know, the panel that was on before me, uh, talking about women in tech. Again, speaking as somebody sort of now able to talk about the price of uh, candy bars when he was a little kid. And, you know, you just got to grow up, right? Like, why are these environments so hostile? Well, because people behave like children in them. They talk in ways that are inappropriate. They don't consider the feelings or the considerations of other people who are in the room. You know, like, this is just not how people behave. And what we've done with these technologies is bring some of these behaviors completely to the forefront so that they dominate the discourse. And so in many ways, I think our civic life, we're, these tools aren't going away, right? There's inevitability there. So your point is we're screwed. No, 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 my point is, no, because growing, like my kids, my kids right now, I have a 21-year-old and a 24-year-old. And I think a lot of the time they're looking at me going, you know, if you'd have told me it was this hard, I just wouldn't have been born. Like, if you'd have told me that growing up has all this ambiguity and it's all so difficult and it doesn't always turn out, that's what I mean by using the metaphor for growing up. There is no silver bullet here. There is no silver bullet. And many of these things are going to be diffusions of attitudes that spread among people. But we're better than we were in the Middle Ages. We're smarter. We're much more literate. We're much more facile. We're, we're better in many respects because we've grown up culturally from what we used to be to what we are now. And I think that over the next 100 years, we can do a lot more growing up. We just need to accelerate it. And so when I see the conversations that are happening on the internet, that are talking about civility, and hey, you know, like, what do we do when people behave in these ways? And how is it that we can out people and confront them? And those, I think, are all examples of us growing up at a pace that maybe we've never been able to do before because we can have that conversation out in the open. So, you know, these, these things tend to have a, a sort of two-edged sword to them. We've got a guy in the back. So I don't have so much a question, but more of a food for thought. I'm oh, awesome. And, and it was just uh, actually a week or so ago, I was talking to a gentleman who works as, for the Attorney General in, in Idaho here. And, and his comment was that our legislators and lawyers don't lead society with our laws. They said, we follow them. We just follow the people. And so your whole talk has been, technology is revolutionizing how we behave, how we talk, how we do things. And it is, and it is inevitable. What I would suggest is that what could stop Uber? Not that we should, but we in this room are leaders. And so our voice, needs to be heard with our legislators. And, and if we want to stop Uber, we need to let them know. If we want Uber to continue, we need to let them know. What we need to do is parse out the good from the technological revolution and try and prevent a little bit of the unintended consequences. And it's this room, okay? It's not the legislators, they don't understand how to code an HTML, okay? They don't even understand or are on yik-yak. They don't understand this change. They need to hear about it. 
And they need to hear about it from you because only the people in this room really understand it. And so the next revolution is not, I'm a mechanical engineer, right? So the next revolution is not coming from mechanical engineering, okay? It's coming from software. And you guys are the software people. So you guys have a very special place to guide the 21st and 22nd century. So let me reinforce that point a little bit. How many of you participated, even in a small way, maybe through social media, in communicating your position on net neutrality in some public way? And what happened? Right? Like it looked for sure like the fix was in and we were all screwed. And those who knew how the internet grew up and what it needed to be were going to be subjugated to corporate interests. It totally looked like it was baked. And then it wasn't. Because these very tools that we're talking about raised such a hue and cry that it became apparent that the right thing to do was to enforce net neutrality. And, and at least for the moment, we're moving in that direction. And that's an example of what you're describing. And so it's absolutely true that this becomes a big piece of the discourse. But it's not an automatic that we know exactly what to do. Because like you know, we're talking about Uber, it's relatively innocuous. But who knows where the next mechanical turkey comes from? And what does it do to the, to the economic sector that it changes? Let me throw another one at you. I'm, I've been thinking about this for a little while. So UC Berkeley, a group of researchers, has come up with a pretty reliable way to alter the human genome, the germline cells that can be passed on to the next generation, not just any part of the genome, right? This is inheritable stuff. The very researchers who researchers who have come up with it have said there should be a moratorium on its use. That's fine in the US, but we don't control what happens in China, Singapore, Korea, countries that have different standards of ethics. So when you see situations like this where, where the technology could have unforeseen circumstances, what do you do about that? Should we not be pursuing technological advances? Should we not be using machines to do these things that we don't actually fully understand? Okay, so I'm gonna take a really outrageous position. I'm gonna say that, yeah, how many of you are familiar with Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene? Right, so the selfish gene idea is this notion that while we tend to think about biology as organism-centric, because we're organisms and it seems like the world is made up of organisms, and genes just kind of are the code that makes a person. The, the Richard Dawkins perspective is, no, no, no. You're a side effect that a gene needs in order to get itself into the next generation. You are what he calls a survival vehicle for genes to be able to propagate. And that the real thing that's happening is the genes propagating from one generation to the next. You are just some sort of temporary artifact that, that houses them and allows them to be evaluated, you know, to see if they like lead to better survival or lesser survival so that the gene pool can change over time. Now what I'm gonna contend is, in the same way that like looking at biology from that point of view makes you think about it in a different way, looking about at technology, not as our servant, but as a kind of sociological phenomenon that runs on top of us the science and the technology that is advancing and that lasts longer than any one human life is running on a distributed computing network that is us. And we think that we control it. But all you have to do is take a question like this and you realize, oh, you don't control Jack. Because the minute an idea like that emerges, it will find devices to run. And if it starts to be successful, it will find more devices to run. And a group of devices, say, under the leadership of the Boise City Council, might say, we refuse to run this. Furthermore, we won't trade with anyone who does. And that might be enough pressure, enough selection pressure, to kill that idea. Unless that idea is worth something, like money. Because if it is, then it will find lots of other places to run on. And those places might be here or there or somewhere else. We have to start to understand this thing like a phenomenon, not like a human. Like we think of human activity like it's regulatable. But when these things are running on all these people, if you don't want to do it, it's like being the guy that doesn't want to work on Saturday. 
Like, I get it. We shouldn't work on Saturday. Yes, none of us should work on Saturday. We're all not going to work on Saturday. But see, if they all work on Saturday, you're screwed. You just die, and they win. And so there's a lot of things like that in our society today that, we are under, that we're thinking about as though they're choices we get to make. And what's really happening is they're pressures by an organism that's running on top. Culture's kind of nutty. This is super depressing, and I'm keeping all the tokens because I need to drink. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on, time, time, time out, time out. What do you mean super depressing? Do you see this device right here? This device is everything that you could get technologically in the 1960s. Like it plays movies for you, it makes games for you, it, it delivers the paper for you, it can control the stuff in your house, it can, it can bring goods to your home. Like seriously, you just go like a tiger. And the next thing you know, it's on the doorstep. What are you talking about? I'm depressed by technology. Please. We gotta grow up though. We gotta understand this thing that's running on top of us. And we have to understand better and better, more and more, how do we turn these things to good. But I think that the idea that we can resist them, I think that's like wishing. Questions? You're not asking questions? Surely we should be drinking by now. <laughs> okay, there's one part of the argument you have. Can you wait for the mic, please? Hold on, the mic's coming to you. There's one part of the argument you haven't addressed, and that's access to technology and who has access to it. And when you talk about genetics, okay, it's going to be the rich, and we could go into a very nightmarish scenario. Hey, dude, are you kidding? Like, have you ever seen these movies where, like, all the rich people learn how to live forever? And, right, and, like, they're spending all this money and they can get to be five, six hundred years old, and the rest of us have to live these brutal, mortal lives in support of the, like, I, I love those movies. <laughs> so, so, no, I'm with you on this. And I'll tell you, this, this access thing, those guys in the Chicago, and they were largely men, in the Chicago Board of Trade, who used to do trading of commodities, and provided a really valuable service to the United States, and made a bucket load of money for themselves, they tended to come from middle class backgrounds, or even lower class backgrounds. It was a way, you could be a trader without going to college, as long as you were good at it, and you could still make a killer living, right? Those folks didn't get access to technology. The access to the technology went to a different way of doing it at a different level of the firm, and then all of a sudden, those people are just out. So like, you spent 20 years doing this, and now like, you're out. So just go retrain. Yeah, easy to say when you're the guy telling someone to do it as opposed to having to do it. The gap between being able to use one of these and not, it's really starting to be telling. Like it used to be just that you could just win every bar argument, right? Like you'd be in the bar and people, oh, that happened in 65. No, 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 it was 66, I'm sure. And you just look it up, it was 37 and we're done. But now, if you can really use one of these, you can communicate with like 500 people a day where humans can only communicate with maybe 10. You can communicate with such precision very complex ideas to mobilize enormous numbers of productive forces in the service of your ideas while other people are still running around trying to figure out where the bathroom is, right? So this gap is enormous, but if you think there's any way to prevent it, let's legislate, let's change, no. The only option is to make people better with it. That's the only option. And, and to recognize that the people who don't have access to it or can't figure out how to employ it, they're screwed. And so we need to get better at figuring that out. But absolutely, so many people are talking about, oh yeah, we need to ban this, and we need to prevent that, and we need to stop this. Hey, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. All you do then is make sure that other people get to do those things. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk about the, the medical and the gene modification. So got it, UC Berkeley, top of, top of the hill, brightest people in the world there's a whole other open source organization who's using 3D printers to look at disease cures and their 3D printer costs like seven, $7,000. And they're funding that now around the world. So back to technology is coming. We can either lead the way or we're gonna get run over by it. 
Hey, the debate in Iran. It, what it, is the debate in Iran about? The debate in Iran is about can we prevent the dissemination of the technology or can't we? We have managed to kind of do it for about 50 years, literally using everything, including the US military, to prevent its spread. And nevertheless, we might get this one done. We might not get this one done. I don't, you know, like where you are politically on this particular one. If you think that 100 years hence, that genie is still in the bottle and nobody knows how to do it but us, I just, I, I think th these are just not ways that the world can work out. All right, how close to drinking are we? Okay, we got another guy. You know, I, I'm focused on the most important parts of this festival. <laughs> All right, we have time for two more questions. So there's two chances yet to uh, earn a drink ticket. Just a quick question. You have built a lot of the system on mechanical turkers, but you haven't actually explained who these people are, and that really seems to be exploiting an entire unnamed group of people, an unnamed group of individuals, which is the basis of your business model. Now, part of the concerns that have come up today are ethics, open society, transparency. Well, if your economic system is just on continued exploitation of the underprivileged, how are you actually contributing something positive and not just supporting like first world mathematics learning? Yeah, no, absolutely, I mean, it's, a, it's a fair do question. You, do you have a model perhaps for a more fair, or equitable pay-based system for something like mechanical? You know, I would say that we don't. Right, because we're still very much in the experimental phase. And so we're currently working with, uh, with undergraduates at the university. But let's talk about what those, what those undergraduates do, right? They're working for somewhere between $10 and $15 an hour, which is a pretty good wage for an undergraduate. And, and they actually get a pretty solid benefit out of doing it. What they do is erode the position of somebody who has a PhD in mathematics who is used to commanding a much greater amount of money. Now, up until now, none of this has happened, right? We're still very much exploring it. And I'm not sure that my institution will end up doing it at all. What I'm suggesting is that the minute it's possible for it to be done, it will be done. And when it's done, the people who are joined in the Mechanical Turk system, they're generally doing it out of economic self-interest. They're like, yeah, I'm really pretty good at mathematics. I'm currently a student studying pick your university around the country or around the world, and I am able to help a high school student in the US for a micropayment, it absolutely works for me. What it tends to do is erode the people at the top to benefit the people from below. But overall, right, it reduces the amount of money that goes into that economic activity period. And it also can tend to spread it. Many, many, many more people are taking Uber than were taking cabs. Like, they expanded the market and got lots of more people to drive. But I submit to you that now those drivers, on average, make less than what a protected taxi driver used to make. And so, you know, what I'm describing here is not what any one group or any one set of people will do. Somebody might come up with a fair and equitable and just and good way to do it. But if the other way, the exploitive way, or the quasi-exploitive way, the one that's like sort of right on the border of what a society can tolerate, performs 10 times better than this one, it's inevitable that this one gets destroyed. I'm not saying that's my opinion. It's not saying I, I, don't, I wish it wasn't like that. It just is like that. Here comes the mechanic Turk with his last microphone delivery. We're so close to drinking people. So I love what you're saying when it, uh, on that response specifically. What I see is that in my organization, I think that if you're not coding, you'll be coded. So you better figure out how to code. Okay, um, I don't care if you're in accounting or if you're in human resources, you've got to figure that. it out. And so, but coding doesn't always mean writing Java. It means being able to write if statements, right? And be able to logic through and create gates. Um, what I haven't seen in education is where we're creating that logic and those gates that allow kids at a young age to accelerate into this. We've, we've categorized it as, hey, you've got to learn how to write Java or, or Ruby. Uh, I could care less if everybody in my company knew how to write Ruby. I want them to be able to logic through a problem, whether they come from a social sciences or whatever. So from a higher education standpoint, are you seeing people entering into that higher education with those skill sets that allow them to uh, excel? So what I would say is it's a, that's a classic example of the divide. There's a set of people who are, who are able to express complex ideas in the language of code in a way that people in the age of Turing couldn't even imagine doing. We've got undergraduates who can conceive of very complicated problems in very great detail. This is a skill that the human race has only had for 50 years. 
Alan Turing, by the way, if you haven't seen The Imitation Game, get out there, right? Because he's the patron saint of what we do. And so when he's like first working with the computer, he's hewing out of the rock as one of the first people ever to sort of think about in a very methodical way how you would write a program to do division, how you would write. And now we have tens of thousands of people in high school, coming out of high school, who can conceive of way more complicated things and, and execute them on these machines so that they will always work. And the human race has only been able to do that for 50 years. And so that's an amazing thing that these people can do. But then there's all the people who come who can't do it. And for them, this is all just like, oh yeah, I don't know, some kind of magic thing that happens. I don't know how it works. And I think like you, that's a very unsafe position to be in. That's a very unsafe position to be in. So the, the drive that we got to get everybody sort of literate in this new way of expressing ideas, right, that is, that is as revolutionary in its power as the ability to write down things in text was when it first emerged. We're remaking the Anthropocene with these constructs that we write that are very complicated, but that only a small sector of our society, relatively speaking, understands. And I'm, I'm not sure that that is a good thing going forward. Although, if it's a thing that you can do, it makes you pretty valuable, so good for us. <laughs> hey, thanks everybody. Enjoy the rest of the uh, festival. Let's go, Jeff.